So what I'm going to talk about next is one of the underlying ideas behind Awesomeness Fest and the whole idea of mind hacking, of hacking someone's mind so that you really get to grow. It's called the theory of awesomeness. This is a speech that I actually created about uh, in 2009, in October 2009. Some of you who were in Bali have already heard this presentation. You don't have to stay. If you want to go out and enjoy the beach, you totally can. Some of you who were here last year would already have heard 50% of this stuff. I modify things every year. I adapt it. I, I refine it. So if you want to stay, I would strongly recommend that. Okay, so anyway, if you need to go out and enjoy the beach, if you were here at Bali, it's not a problem. Just go on ahead. It's not impolite at all. Let's get started. Now, let's go with the start and how things started out for me. It was 2003. I mentioned a while ago that I was working for a dot-com and it grew really massively from zero to 20 million in two years, but I went through the craziest stress of my life. I was living in New York, I had a girlfriend who was living in Europe, and it was crazy stressful. I was literally putting on weight, my health was a complete mess, I wasn't exercising, I wasn't meditating, and I was making decent money, but I was just an employee at that time. That is me 10 years ago. Now, you can see I could barely afford to wear pants, I'm a lot chubbier than I am right now. The chair and the table that I'm working on was actually stuff that I salvaged from the street. I literally went out a winter's day in New York. My neighbor had tossed out that chair and that, and that table. And it wasn't even like a fancy table. It was a, a lack from Ikea. Um, brought that in. I was really, really, really broke. See, what had happened was I'd taken some time off to go to Europe to get married, marry my girlfriend. When I came back, my boss in New York said, you know, kid, you were gone way too long. I had you replaced. And I said, what? But I came all the way back. And see, I was an American citizen. If I lost that job, I couldn't stay in the US. He said, don't worry. You can keep the visa, but I'm going to cut your salary in half. So now I had a wife who was a European. She couldn't work in, in New York. I'd just come back. I now had a family. And my salary had been cut in half. That was how I started. But as we all know, when shit happens, right, it kind of gives you a kick in the butt to do something bigger. So I decided. I can't work for this company anymore, need to start my own thing. Now, I decided to start a little online business selling meditation CDs. It wasn't even my own stuff, it was simply other stuff that I found on the internet. I was doing what we now know as affiliate marketing. That business grew. That business is what became Mind Valley. It's what spawned Awesomeness Fest. But I want you to know that 10 years ago, that business, Mind Valley, was founded in that little apartment in Times Square, in New York. That's the Playwrights Tavern. It's on 8th Avenue in New York. That is Times Square. And I don't mean Disneyland Times Square like what it is right now. That was Hookers and Crack Times Square from 10 years ago. <laughs> See, before, before I founded Mind Valley, this great personal development company in that little apartment, that place, two years before I moved in, was a Thai massage parlor, <laughs> which means Mind Valley was actually founded in a former whorehouse. But that's just amongst friends. Um, now, my background, okay? I want you to know, it gets sadder, my background. I was a C-plus student. I did study at computer engineering at the University of Michigan, great school. Unfortunately, I wasn't as great as most of the other students. My GPA was 2.5, I almost dropped out. When I graduated, the only company that would hire me was a nonprofit in New York, and I was working for below the poverty line. I tried to start a business, I completely failed, lost everything I had, and I was $30,000 in the hole. At that point, I was living in Berkeley, and I was so broke, I couldn't afford an apartment, so I was renting a couch from a college student. And it wasn't even a three-seater couch, it was a two-seater couch, so I slept every night with my legs dangling off the edge. The only job I could get, it was April 2001, the bubble in Silicon Valley had just burst. I came to Silicon Valley with big dreams. I thought I was going to start a dot-com, build it up, get VC money. Nothing happened. April 2001, the bubble burst. 14,000 people were laid off in Silicon Valley. And a lot of those people who were laid off were a hell of a lot smarter and more qualified than I am. So I had no luck at all in getting a job. The only job I could get was a commission-only sales gig. There was a little tech company that was hiring. And they said, hey, listen, uh, we'll hire you but we aren't gonna pay you nothing. You close a deal, a technology deal, you get paid. You don't close a deal, you starve. That's how I started my career. One of the guys I, I joined that company with, Jamie Schiller is in the room. Jamie, are you here? We are friends from like 10 years ago. That's Jamie, we both joined this company together. I proceeded to then work for that company and did well until I got married, came back and got demoted and had my salary cut in half. Then I tried to start a business 
ended up 30 grand in the hole, and that's kind of how things started out for me. But wait, it gets worse. <laughs> this was shortly after September 11. Somehow, I ended up on a terrorism watch list. Um, <laughs> It's a, I, I, I don't know how that happened. Maybe it's because I'm brown and unshaven. But technically, what happened was I was put on a watch list called special registration, which means that I could only leave and enter the US through certain airports. Now, that was fine. I couldn't go through certain airports, so my trips were always longer than normal. When I arrived, I had to be escorted to a private room for an interrogation and an interview. And so it always took me like three hours to come out of an airport. Sometimes my bags would go missing in that process. But the worst part was this. Every four weeks, I had to report to the US government. I lived like I was on parole. Every four weeks, I had to go down to um, the city center uh, in New York City, uh, wait in this long line, even during winter, a long line that stretched four blocks to go and get fingerprinted and interviewed and give them my credit card so they can track all my purchases and see if I bought you know, anything suspicious like fertilizer. So <laughs> I remember. I remember I was standing in this long line. It was, it was cold. It was approaching winter. It was cold. It was a long line. The guy in front of me was some North Korean organ smuggler. The guy behind me <laughs> was some shady looking dude from Iran. They were nice folks though, but you know, I felt I didn't really belong there. And as, as the line got shorter and shorter and I came closer and closer and closer to that, 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 that um, immigration, uh, that immigration official, I did everything I could to be and act American. You know, I wore my Michigan uh, college t-shirt. <laughs> I, I had a baseball cap and, and I would time it. So just when like the North Koreans turn was about to, to end, so it was my turn, I would turn to the Iranian behind me, put my baseball cap backwards and go, yo, this is whack, dude. <laughs> it didn't work. I was on that list for five years and that's when I decided I had to leave America. So um, I wanted to settle in the US. I wanted to start Mind Valley in the US. We couldn't because of the paranoia that happened after September 11. As a result, I moved back to Malaysia. Now again, I do believe bad things happen for good reasons. And I'm glad it happened because we ended up starting Mind Valley in there. But I want you to know that it wasn't an easy ride, and I started down from like crazy, crazy, crazy debts. I'm sharing this with you, not because I want you to think I was some sort of loser, but because I know many of you have probably been there. You've been beaten down, you've been in shitty situations, and I wanna know that when things click, massive, rapid transformation happens. Now, five years l l later, Mind Valley was fully formed in, in, in Malaysia. Things were going okay. Today, though, let's step forward 10 years. As I said, we're celebrating our 10th birthday on November, on, on November 22nd. Today, we have a beautiful company. Uh, we have tons of amazing products. We are highly profitable. Uh, I have an amazing team that comes from all around the world. Over 100 people now work in our office in Kuala Lumpur, 130 if you count our offices all around the world. And we have an office that, according to Inc. Magazine, was one of the top 10 coolest workplaces in the world in 2012. We have our own auditorium in the city of Kuala Lumpur, where, which we give free to NGOs in Kuala Lumpur which are sharing entrepreneurship. I have you guys at Awesomeness Best, whom I get to hang out with every single year. I get to share the stage with inspiring people like Lisa Nichols. My wife and I get to take beautiful uh, vacations. And I have, as of 10 days ago, two kids. <laughs> Hayden is six and Eve is 10, 10 days old. I just got that photo today actually from my wife who's in Europe. A photographer friend of ours took it. So I feel really blessed right now. But 10 years ago, my life was an absolute mess. 10 years ago, that was who I was. And if any of you were on a terrorism watch list and had to sal salvage used furniture from the streets and had a boss who cut your salary in half, I can totally relate. <laughs> so the fact is, how did I bounce back so fast, right? One of the things about me is I, I'm a really analytical person. Maybe it's my computer engineering training. I like to analyze, to, to tear apart, to put pieces together, try to figure out what makes things work the way they work. And so I tried to figure out what was it that I went through in life that caused that shift. I think I got it and I think I understand it and I think it's replicable and it's a model that anyone can learn. I call it the theory of awesomeness and it starts with a simple observation. It has to do with Starbucks, coffee and Subway sandwiches. See, my first year starting my business, right? I started Mind Valley for about $700. And it took me about $700 before we made our first profit. That first profit was a grand total 
of $4.50 a day. And I remember how psyched I was about that. I remember going out to the bars with my friends in New York and going, dude, I have got this crazy online business. I make four bucks and 50 cents a day. That's a free grande Starbucks mochaccino. <laughs> I was proud of that. And that continued for about a month. In month four, the business grew. Now I was making five bucks and 50 cents a day. You guys get that, that means. That means I'm now upgraded to a venti with whipped cream and hazelnut syrup. <laughs> that was epic. But it continued growing. By month seven, I was making 12 bucks a day. Now, I could get my Starbucks coffee and a Subway sandwich. And I was happy, I was ecstatic. My life was wonderful. I would come back from my day job and spend one to two hours every night building up this little online business and seeing just how much free junk breakfast food I could score <laughs> for about a year. But then one day, it got so big, I found out I could quit my day job. I remember that day. I realized that I'd made $20,000 in profit in my first year running this little business called Mind Valley. And so I called my boss and I said, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna figure out how I wanna be an entrepreneur, and I think I have enough right now to make a safe leap. And, and I did that, and Mind Valley was born. Now, we moved back to Malaysia at that point. That's me, my wife, and some of our early team. That's working from um, little, it, it looks nice, but really it was a decently furnished room in the back area of a really grungy warehouse in a downtrodden neighborhood in Kuala Lumpur. But that's how we started. And the thing is, things didn't go well. The first year was wonderful. The Starbucks and Subway years, absolutely amazing. The business was like a game. Every single day I was trying to see how much food I could score. But in year two, three, four, and five, Oh my God, the stress started really grinding into me. All of a sudden, I had to worry about office space and rent and salaries and taxes and growth and, and business plans and all these other things, and work stopped being fun. And as a result, Mind Valley was growing like this, and then it just started kind of stagnating. We went through four years of struggle, year two to year five, four years of struggle, until that month I mentioned earlier, May 2008, when I calculated, we'd done a quarter million in revenue, but were making a loss of 15,000. And I knew that if something didn't change, within a few months, we were gonna have to fold. What I didn't tell you is that in May 2008, I'd had my business for five years, but guess what? I was poorer than I was when I started. I was earning a salary, so as a business entrepreneur, I was paying myself a salary, but it was less than what I was making in New York five years before. I was still ridiculously in debt. My business partner at that time had a Stanford MBA, and he was in debt. He still had to pay his college loans. We were not making money. A lot of people think if you're an entrepreneur, you're making money. Not true. You can be an entrepreneur, and you can be flat broke and making less than decently paid employees. That's where we were in year five. If Mind Valley had folded then, I'd go actually wasted five years of my life building up absolutely nothing and been poorer than if I'd never started. That was how bad it was. That was what caused me to dive into self-exploration and personal growth and try to figure out what was this shit going on in my head that was slowing things down so much. I poured it myself into books. I studied with many amazing mentors. Neil Donald Walsh, Esther Hicks, Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, Harv Ecker. Make some sounds if you guys have studied these legends. Pretty awesome guys. And, and that's when things started clicking. I started to realize that the fundamental attribute of being a successful entrepreneur had nothing to do with the right marketing or strategy or business plans. It all had to do with your models of the world, your belief systems. In April 2008, I wrote this. That's the actual piece of paper uh, I photographed. So remember, I was losing money, May, April. And I wrote this in a piece of paper. By June 2008, Mind Valley does 300K in sales. I knew that that was the magic number. If we could hit that, we could be profitable, wouldn't have to lay off any staff. It didn't happen in June. But in July 2008, it happened. We surpassed that magic number, 300K. But then things got crazy. It started accelerating. By December, as I invested more in my personal growth, the company started to grow. It was really weird. It was as if the company and me were inextricably linked. And as I grew, the business grew. In eight months, we grew 400% from a quarter million a month to a million a month. And that is the mind value that we have today. It only took eight months. The point I'm trying to make is not that I was some sort of like entrepreneurial genius. The point I'm trying to make is that I freaking failed for five years until something shifted. And when that shift happened, everything 
changed. And that shift, once you get it, it changes your life really fast. In fact, the biggest surprise I had was how rapidly things fell into place once I changed my mindset. That's an actual chart of, of, of our growth rate. You can see the first five years, very slow, and then boom, we just started exploding. And in fact, we went from $700 of my own money, which I used to start the business, to 20 million in revenue, an evaluation of over 40 million in the last 10 years with no investors or VCs or angel money. We took $700, we turned it into 40 million. That's over 65,000 times ROI in 10 years. And to this day, I still own 100% of the company because when that shift happens, it happened in a dramatic scale. Question is, what changed? What was it? And, it's, and as I said earlier, I really believe this shift is replicable, and that's what I'd like to share with you guys. So here's the theory I had, right? And again, this is just a theory. As I said, with all belief systems, with all models, you don't have to accept them. You choose and decide, is this going to serve you? If you believe this model that I'm about to share serves you, by all means, accept it. Take it into your own life. If you think it's absolute bollocks, you're free to discard it. But this is what I think happened. Now, I believe that there's a delicate balance in human existence. And if you can find a way to live in this balance, really cool things happen in your life. The balance is this. It's a balance between being happy in the now and having a vision of, your, of a good future. Happiness right now and a vision for the future. Two things, happiness in the now, a vision for the future. Sounds simple, right? But actually it's not, because based on these two variables, there are four different states of mind that any of you could be in. You could have no happiness, and no vision for the future. In that case, you're in what we call a negative spiral. In short, somewhat of a depression. If you're in this case, you probably need psychological help. It's really, really, really hard to come out without having support. But there's another state, and that's where you don't have a vision for the future. You don't really know how you're gonna grow or what you wanna build, but you are happy right now. This should be great, but I don't think it is. I call it the current reality trap, because it is a trap. Happiness and fulfillment are two completely different things. Happiness is something you can get from a good joint. Fulfillment <laughs> comes from something different. So if you're just happy right now, but you have no vision of how you want to grow and how you want to develop and how you want to serve the world or what you want to build, you're not really fulfilled, are you? If you aren't growing, you're doing a disservice to your mission and to the world. You've got to dream big, play big, push your boundaries. In the words of Marianne Williamson, by letting your light shine, you grant permission for others to do the same. And that's why purely being happy, but having no vision for the future, isn't the best state to be in. But there is a third state, and this is the state most entrepreneurs are in. We call it stress and anxiety. This is where, watch my hands, you have a vision for the future, but you're just not happy yet. You have that vision for that new grand office space you want to build, that new revenue target you want to hit, that new product you want to get out to market, but your happiness, you've decided happiness will come when I get there. In other words, right now, I'm going to toil and struggle and stress out, but when I get to those goals, then I'll be happy. Problem is, that isn't the optimal state, and most entrepreneurs who are in that state never actually hit happiness. Think about it this way, right? This is where you are. This is where you want to be, to be happy. But if you're like any entrepreneur, as soon as you get there, what happens? You extend that line. There's another vision of your future that you need to get to, to be happy. So happiness becomes this elusive thing that is always ahead of you and never with you right now. Then there's the final state, which is what we call the state of flow. Now I'm not using the word flow the way Mihaly Simentali uses the word flow, which means engagement. I'm using it to describe something else. And I'll tell you what, how, how I describe the state. The state of flow is when you have a vision pulling you forward, but you're happy right now. In other words, your happiness and your vision are completely separate. Your happiness is not tied to your vision. Your happiness comes from the journey, not the destination. I define the flow state like this, a mental state of mind in which you are pulled forward by big goals, yet happy where you are now. It creates a feeling of growth, a feeling of being lucky. The weirdest thing about the flow state is that when you are in this state, it almost feels as if the universe has your back. It kind of feels like there's this wind blowing you and you seem to move in the right direction, that everything you touch seems to turn to gold, that the right coincidences, synchronicities, opportunities fall on your lap, that even if you do have downtime, you bounce back really quickly. It almost feels as if you can bend reality 
It feels as if you have conscious control of luck. Can anyone relate to this? Have you ever felt like that? Isn't it funny that it's almost 80% of the room that would raise their hand because you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'd like to be very scientific, but the fact is there is this state that we often fall into, and whether it's mythical or it's real doesn't matter. I believe that if you believe that this state exists, you're more likely to want yourself to be there and more likely to reap the benefits. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm always in the flow state. All of us are going to have our ups and our downs, our ups and our downs, our ups and our downs. The goal, though, is to expand the amount of time you're having an up and to reduce the amount of time you're having a down. So you expand the ups, you reduce the downs. So you're more up, and when you go down, you bounce back really quickly. So based on this model, you can exist in any of these four places, current reality trap, depression, stress, flow. Where do you want to be? Let me ask that again. Where do you want to be? Okay. Here's a very important paradox, though, which holds, us all, which holds many of us back from flow. It comes from a book called Quantum Success. You must have goals, but your happiness cannot be tied to your goals. You must be happy before you attain them. So how do you untangle happiness from goals? The beautiful thing, though, is, is that there's a ton of like, research that shows that this is truly possible. But before we get there, let's talk about a few hyper-successful people who I believe existed in this state. There's Steve Jobs. If, um, if you read the book Jobs by w Walter Isaacson, it's really interesting because in that book, they mention the word bending reality three times in reference to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, as you know, had a rather uh, um, a strong interest in mysticism. He spent some time in India, he meditated. He, he believed in, in, in experiential wisdom or prana, the art of using intuition rather than simply always being purely logical. This is another quote which I really like. I go into every situation expecting to win. Thinking like this often turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Does this sound like a man who is in flow? I go into every situation expecting to win. Thinking like this often turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy. That was Sam Walton. Before Apple became the most highly valued company in the world, Walmart had attained that goal in the 1980s, thanks to Sam Walton and, 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 his, and his wisdom. Then there was this poem that was written about 100 years ago. I was early thought to work as well as play. My life has been one long happy holiday, full of work, full of play. I dropped the warrior on the way, and God was good to me every day. That was written by John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil 100 years ago when he was 86. Again, if you look at the words in that poem, really sounds like John D. Rockefeller believed in this idea of being in flow. He was one of the most ambitious men who ever lived, but he said, I dropped the worry along the way. Then, of course, there's Richard Branson, whom I think is perpetually in flow. So me and, uh, and a few other entrepreneurs, some of whom are in this room, were in Necker Island about um, sometime in 2009. And we got to actually interview Branson and ask him a couple of questions. One of the questions we asked him is, how do you stay productive? You have 300 different companies. How do you stay productive? And he goes, you know, I don't really use any productivity tools. I, I just make lots of lists. Every morning when I wake up, I make a list of the things I have to do. This is one of Branson's actual lists from his book. And you will see, it's not small stuff. It's not pick up milk on the way home from work today. It's ring Steve Fossey. It's start an airline. He wrote the word Nigeria, probably starting a business there. It's really epic stuff. In short, it's a list of visions, of goals. Now, we also remember that we asked Branson, what do you do when you're sad? Surely your life isn't always happy. And this is what he said. I can't remember the bad times. I only remember the good things that happen in my life. He's a guy who always had big visions, but what is always happy. I remember one particular situation where a whole group of us were sitting at a dinner table, and Branson came and joined us. And as soon as Branson came and joined that dinner table, all these other entrepreneurs started bombarding him with boring business questions. So Branson, what do you do about in this situation? Branson, I'm thinking about getting investment in this. What do you think I should do? And Branson simply dismissed all of them. He got on the table. He gently moved plates out of the way with his foot. Then he grabbed my wife by, his, by her hand, pulled her on the table, and started dancing with her. <laughs> and that's the kind of guy that he is, always in flow, always happiness. I love that about him. So we've talked about the theory, right? And we've seen that a lot of successful entrepreneurs seem to abide by this theory. Big goals, 
but happiness in the now. But how do we take the theory and put it into practice? These are systems that I'd like to teach you. So we've now been talking about the model of flow, the belief system. Let's talk about systems that we can put into your life to put you in flow. Let's start with the first ingredient of flow, which is happiness in the now. Science is telling us that happiness does not come from within. Sorry, that happiness does not come from outside us. It comes from within us. And happiness is actually something that's easily malleable. It's easily adjustable once you learn the right ways. I wish we were teaching these to our kids in school. There would be so many less cases of depression and hardship in the world. We, schools haven't caught up yet. But here's a couple of things that we know really, really, really boost happiness. But before that, before I go there, why happiness, right? Here's some scientific evidence that talks about happiness and how it changes the way we function and work. Doctors who are happy make 19% better diagnosis. And you know, the scientists who did this study, it was described in Sean Aker's book, The Happiness Advantage. You know how they made the doctors happy? They gave the doctors a lollipop before the doctors went in to see the patient. <laughs> and the funny thing is, the doctors were not even allowed to actually eat the lollipop because that might mess up their sugar content and they wanted to keep the test like really um, uh, empirical so they couldn't take to ingest any sugar, which according to Sean Aker begs the question, should the doctor be giving us the lollipop or should we be giving the doctor the lollipop? Yeah. And then you have salespeople. Optimistic salespeople outsell pessimists by a whopping 56%. In terms of students, students primed to be happy outperform their neutral peers. We see this evidence almost everywhere we look in terms of happiness, according to Aker. It turns out our brains are literally hardwired to perform at their best, not when they are negative or even neutral, but when they are positive. One of the craziest studies, though, is happiness on lifespan. So they did this study with nuns. They took a bunch of nuns who had been um, who were approaching 90 years old, and they divided these nuns into four different segments. These nuns had been journaling. So in this particular nunnery, it was normal for nuns to write a journal. So they went back through all the journals, and they divided these journals into four categories, most negative, happiest, and then the category in between. Now, they looked at the bottom 25%, the most negative, and the top 25%, and this is what they found. By age 85, those in the top 25%, 90% of these nuns were alive. Those in the bottom, 34% were alive. Happiness can literally increase your lifespan, and lack of it can kill you. So how do you inject happiness in your life? I love the word embodiment practices. It talks about stuff that we can do to embody it into our lives. These are some beautiful systems you can bring in almost instantaneously to level up your happiness. The first is meditation. You'll be learning that here at Awesomeness Fest. Studies are showing remarkable things about the power of meditation. From Time Magazine, not only does studies show that meditation is boosting the immune system, but brain scans suggest that it may be rewiring their brains to reduce stress. Meanwhile, we non-believers are becoming the minority. 10 million American adults now say they practice some form of meditation regularly, twice as much as a decade before. Now, this was written in 2003. Right now, I believe it's now 2013. It's probably 20 million. How many of you here meditate every single day? Now, here's the crazy thing, right? That's 15% of the room. Science is saying that if you meditate every single day, even though it may take you 15 minutes, you more than make up for that time in the span of your day by better levels of happiness, better health, more focus, more productivity. It shifts your entire life. Yet, only 15% of you meditate on a daily basis. How many of you here brush your teeth every single day? <laughs> how many of you here shower every single day? So here's the funny thing, and this shows how, how human beings, how human beings often follow trends, but not, do not operate rationally. Meditation will probably have a bigger impact on your life than showering. <laughs> it will. I'm not saying I, don't, I skip my shower every day. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I do both. But the fact is, it probably will have a bigger impact on your life because of how powerful it is. Yet only 15% of you meditate. We all shower, we all brush our teeth, we all use soap. And this is where sometimes our current culture trains us to do certain um, um, beliefs, but, but, but doesn't reinforce others, which are equally important. It's truly important that you do at least try to meditate every single day. If, one, if, if there's one thing I hope you can get out of Awesomeness Fest, it's this practice. We'll be teaching you specific meditation techniques that you can take home with you. The next, and one of the ways you can do that, by the way, is through uh, Mind Valley's meditation app, Omvana. Many free meditations are available on Omvana. 
for iPhone. Now, the second thing which can dramatically elevate levels of happiness is creative visualization. So really, really, really powerful tool. You can do this while meditating. You can do it while in commute. You can do it while sitting in the tub. And all it's about is really visualizing how you want your life to unfold. What does science say about creative visualization? Some pretty amazing things happen. There's a study called the finger abduction experiment. I want all of you to raise your finger. Okay, now do this with your finger. Okay, so the study basically involved that. You can put your fingers down right now. Thank you. The study found this. In the finger abduction, uh, abduction experiment, they found that actual practice, if they took a group, a control group, and they made the control group do that for 15 minutes every day, after about a month, there was a 53% increase in finger strength. That's pretty cool. But the other group they used was a group that did nothing more than visualization. Their fingers were down. They just visualized themselves moving their finger up and down. That led to a 35% strength increase. Visualization alone caused physical changes in the body. It's pretty amazing stuff. And if you study the work of, of doctors such as O'Carl Simonton, O'Carl Simonton runs the Simonton Cancer Research Institute. He's had incredible success teaching people to put their cancers into spontaneous remission by visualizing these cancers disappear. Visualization does amazing things for you. I do it every single day. Then there's intention setting. This was kind of popularized by Esther Hicks. She called it segment intending. Intention setting is simple. It's simply the act of telling yourself how you want your day to unfold. Every single day, I tell myself exactly how I want my day to unfold. I pretend, delusionally or not, that I have control over how reality works. So I'll tell myself when I go in and get breakfast today at the hotel, they're going to be serving the healthy choices that I like. I'm going to have an incredible workout. I'm going to have an incredible lunch conversation. The waiters are going to be super friendly. I'm going to come here, get on stage, do my speech. Everything is going to go flawlessly. I pretend I can command reality. Funny thing is, it starts to feel that way. I love segment intending or intention setting. Number four, inspirational reads. One of the things I do if I don't get a chance to meditate is I would, if I'm in commute or on a plane, I read something inspirational. I love biographies. I love philosopher's notes. Inspirational reads also prime you for happiness because it's almost as if you're borrowing the wisdom of an unofficial mentor, someone who may not be there to sit down with you, but through reading about their goals, their life, the epic things they've done, whether it's, it's Steve Jobs or, or Benjamin Franklin or Akio Morita of Sony, it sparks you to think in a different way. Then there's Mookie, which is morning Nookie. Science has shown that, that, that this has remarkable benefits as well. There is gratitude. <laughs> Studies on gratitude so, so show some amazing results. Martin Seligman did a study on gratitude, and uh, he showed that people who journal for seven days straight, writing down the things they were grateful for, after seven days, they were 2% happier. Now, 2% doesn't sound like much, right? But here's the crazy thing. After six months, they were 9% happier. That seven days of journaling was causing changes in their happiness level six months down the road. Six months down the road, 9% happier. They were not 9% happier because they got a 9% higher salary check or they had 9% more Mookie. They were 9% happier because of something they did six months before. Science shows that gratitude causes more energy, higher emotional intelligence, more forgiving attitudes, less depression, less anxiousness, more feelings of being socially connected, and better sleep. My question is, how many of you here practice gratitude every single morning? That's good, slightly better than meditation, 20%. Awesome. Now, what if you're doing all, all of these things every single day? We're gonna teach you a technique where you can, and all of it, in less than 15 minutes. You'll be learning that at Awesomeness Fest. The results of doing this on your life are going to be crazy amazing. This particular thing I do, I call it the six-phase meditation. It goes through all of these things in 15 minutes flat. It's the single most important thing I do every single day. I'd rather skip breakfast than skip my six-phase meditation. The act of doing this every single day is what we call discipline, the discipline of bliss. The most important discipline, I believe, is the discipline of making sure that you can put yourself in a happy state every single day. Because what else could be more important than being happy and being able to know that you're consciously that you can consciously control your happiness. Are you guys with me? Yes. Paulo Coelho, any Paulo Coelho fans here? Make some noise. 
Paulo Coelho said this, there's one great truth on this planet. Whoever you are, whatever it is that you do, when you really want something, it's because the desire originated in the soul of the universe. The soul of the world is nourished by people's happiness. When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. Beautiful quote, isn't it? But let's try reading that quote backwards. Look at the last line. When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. We get that. But the line before that, the soul of the world is nourished by people's happiness. Nourish the world with your happiness and then watch it conspire, helping you get what you truly seek. So we've talked about happiness. Let's go on to the second big ingredient, vision for the future. Because to purely be happy is great and you will have amazing health benefits, but there's a certain amazing feeling that we call fulfillment that comes from having big visions for the future. The problem with most people is that their problems aren't big enough. Here's what I mean by this. You're worried about that you know, guy who won't call you back or that blemish on your skin or paying um, a little bit extra for groceries because the supermarket hiked its prices or getting a decent flight for that business trip or getting that PowerPoint done on time. All of those are silly, stupid little problems. The happiest, most amazing people in the world have bigger problems. They're worried about cleaning up ocean oil spills or saving endangered animals or building an orphanage or teaching a group of kids in a school so that these kids can grow up to be truly amazing individuals or writing a book or creating a successful company. Those are the problems you want to have. And when you find that you pick bigger problems, the little shit doesn't really bug you anymore and you create more resiliency, more bounce back. Perhaps the guy I know who has demonstrates this most is Elon Musk. That's a couple of us from the XPRIZE Foundation. We are visiting SpaceX, where, where Elon Musk uh, is based. Elon, as you know, runs a number of different companies. That's him. Uh, so we were in that group. There are a couple, a lot of A-Festers were in there as well. Elon has three major companies. SpaceX, which is building rocket ships that are now taking cargo to space. Tesla which is the electric car company that's on frickin' fire. Tesla's stock has soared, and Tesla is changing the face of electric vehicles. And then Solar City, the most successful solar panel installation company in America. So we were at this event, and we got to ask Elon questions. So I, I asked Elon this question. I said, Elon, if we could take you and, you know, put you in a test tube and boil you and distill you into your pure essence, what makes you Elon Musk? And after he laughed at the fact that I just talked about boiling him alive, he said, he said, so, and, I, and I'm going to paraphrase this, right? This is what Elon told us. He said, so when I was a kid, I was, um, I moved from South Africa to the U.S., and I, he was an engineer. And so he decided he wanted to go work for one of the hottest companies in Silicon Valley at that time. He went straight to Silicon Valley because he, he felt that was where all the energy was. That company was Netscape. So he went to Netscape with his resume in hand. He sat in the reception area and he waited for someone to come up to him and say, would you like to interview? But again, Elon was slightly shy. He was an engineer. He didn't have the best people skills. And after waiting there for hours, not a single person came up to him and said, would you like to interview? So he sat there, he got frustrated, and then he said, fuck it, I'm just gonna start my own company. <laughs> and he went on and he started a company. He started a little company that brought the Yellow Pages online. And he and his brothers proceeded to sell this to, to major American newspapers. They ended up selling it for a lot of money. Elon pocketed close to $20 million from the sale of that business. He went on to start his second business, PayPal, which all of you have probably heard of. When PayPal was finally sold to eBay, he pocketed $200 million. Now, he was in his late 20s or early 30s at that time, and uh, he said, at that point, you know, I could have just decided to retire somewhere on a pretty big island, but I wanted to do something bigger. So I decided, wouldn't it be cool if mankind could be an interplanetary species? Now, you've got to be kind of a crazy person to, to pick a problem that big, right? But that was the big problem Elon picked. He could have retired to an island. He could have had all the cars and women and luxury he wanted. He decided, screw that, I want to solve a really major problem. How can I make mankind an interplanetary species? How can we put man on Mars? And so he proceeded to get on the website for NASA to research everything he could about the red planet. And he said there was nothing there. 
So Elon told me, he said, at, at first I thought the website was just not updated. But then I realized it wasn't the website. NASA hadn't been updated. There'd been no progress on the space program since Apollo. So he decided, well, if NASA can't do it, I'm going to do it. So he had $200 million in the bank, and he decided he was going to start his own rocket ship company. Now, while starting SpaceX, he decided there's another massive problem that humanity is facing right now, and that's our reliance on fossil fuels. And yes, people say global warming isn't real, but that's bullshit. It's real, we gotta do something about it. So he said, if Detroit isn't gonna do something about it, I will have to start an electric car company. So he decided to also simultaneously, while building rocket ships so that he could eventually take men to Mars, he was gonna solve our dependency on fossil fuel by creating the world's first successful electric car and doing it in Silicon Valley and not Detroit because he felt the automakers in Detroit had failed to do it before and they were not vested in it. But he didn't stop there. His cousins came up to him and said, Elon, you know, we want to save the world, right? We want to make people more, less dependent on, 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 on fuels. What if we could tap into the power of the sun? Maybe we could start a really successful solar panel installation company. So the third company he started was Solar City. He became the chairman of Solar City. So simultaneously now, he had a rocket ship company, he had an electric car, and he had a solar panel company. And everyone thought he was crazy. Even some of his biggest supporters in Silicon Valley refused to invest in those businesses. Here was a guy doing all three things simultaneously, trying to change the world. But the crazy thing is, when you dream big, your problem becomes small. And problems he did have. And the problems were massive. So with SpaceX, he built his first rocket. And he put in a ton of money to build that first rocket. Guess what? It was launch time. The rocket shot up to space, and it exploded before it could get out of the atmosphere. But he still had some money left, so he designed, redesigned the rocket. They launched rocket number two. Shot up to space, boom, exploded again. Then there was rocket number three. This time, he was lucky. He got someone to invest in it and pay him to put a satellite on the top of that rocket. That's a pretty major deal, to, to get that money to, put that, to launch that satellite to space. The rocket went up and promptly exploded. Now he was down to his final 20 million, and it wasn't just exploding rockets. Tesla Motors, he had hired an amazing designer, an amazing designer to come and read and design the new Tesla car. That designer stole the design and launched a competing car company. And then the CEO of Tesla at that point, he had some major issues with the CEO. He had to discard the CEO. The CEO sued him. Then Elon had five kids with his wife. They went into a divorce. He had to pay millions of dollars to his ex-wife and be the father of five children. And Solar City wasn't doing very good either. Elon said that there was this one day in December 2008 where he felt everything was collapsing. He did not have enough money to pay rent. And he had to borrow money for rent. It was December 2008. There was one bet left, the Ford Rocket. He persuaded a couple of investors to invest in the rocket. He took his final, the last dollars he had, put it into SpaceX, and they had one more bet with that final rocket. If this rocket failed, Elon would fail. There would be no SpaceX. There would be no electric car. Solar panel installations would not be at the level they are right now. That rocket succeeded, and it went up to space, and it delivered that payload, and within a few months, NASA signed a contract worth over $1 billion with SpaceX. In 2009, NASA decommissioned the Space Shuttle. Today, Elon Musk and SpaceX sends America's payloads to space. It wasn't just SpaceX. Tesla Motors took off like wildfire. Today, Elon Musk and Tesla Motors makes electric car batteries, not just for Tesla, but for Daimler Chrysler and other aspiring automotives, uh, automotive companies who want to go in that direction. And third, Solar City grew and grew and grew. And now it's the biggest installation of solar panels in America. One man decided that the world had too many massive problems and he was going to gamble everything so that we could be an interplanetary species. We could end our dependency on fossil fuel and we could embrace solar power because it's good for the Earth. And he pulled it off. When you dream big, your problems become small. Think about the stress and the challenges that he went through. The divorce, custody of five kids, having all the success and selling PayPal for $200 million, then being reduced to have to borrow money for rent. But again, when you dream big, your problems become small. And if there's one thing I can leave you with, it's, it's, it's this. 
Realism is just a socially acceptable form of pessimism. We all owe it to ourselves to dream big. And when you do, you start to find if you can put yourself in that flow state, those crazy big dreams often start coming true because of this, this bizarre shift in your reality where it seems as if the universe is watching over you and the universe has your back. Now, there is a contradiction here, right? Science says this. Good goals are realistic, meaningful, and possible in the new future. Realistic, meaningful, and possible in the new future. This is when people tend to have the best success of attaining goals. But there's a problem with this. I have an issue with the word realistic. I believe that there was a flaw in this study. Now, again, this is my personal belief. The flaw in the study was this. The goal, the scientists are suggesting the goals are realistic because they've forgotten that other ingredient, and that is happiness and in the flow. If you can untangle your happiness from your goals, your goals do not have to be realistic. The people who were setting realistic goals were people who had gotten that idea mixed up. They had to set realistic goals because their happiness was not yet untangled. Their happiness was tied to that goals. So if they knew they were going to attain it because it was realistic, they would stay happy, they would be in flow. But if you can learn to discard, to untangle it, to be happy now through the embodiment practices we just show you, you can go crazy big and trust that the right answers, synchronicities, inspiration, ideas will come to get you there because you are in that state of flow. So don't be realistic. Screw this study. <laughs> now, what is a framework for balanced goals? Here's what I'd like to share. While it's important to set really big goals, right, the other issue that many of us have is that we have an imbalance in terms of our goals. So we might be looking to build a massive company, but our health is going to hack. Or we're looking to, to get a great body, but we have forgotten to have a solid relationship with our children. One of the guys I know with the best balance in life is, is this man, John Butcher. Now, take a look at that picture of John Butcher. How old would you guess he is? Forty? John's about 50 right now, if I calculate right. He's a grandfather. He's, he's a grandfather. He's about 50. He was telling me he has a six-pack. He dresses really well. Once a week, he runs 10 miles just to keep in, in, in shape. He has lives a beautiful life. I've visited Bill Gates' home and Brandon's home, his home, and Branson's home. His home is way better. And uh, the other cool thing he does is he just doesn't believe in living life the way we're trained to live life. For example, three months every year, he plucks out his entire family, grandkids and all, and moves to a foreign country and just lives there for three months. He said he believes his kids can learn more from the bazaars of Egypt than they can from the regular schooling system. That's how John lives. But what truly makes John successful? And he's got amazing children, an amazing marriage, an amazing home, an amazing business. His business is Precious Moments. You know, they make those little porcelain dolls. They do about 600 million a year, so it's a massive business. But John's side project is Lifebook. See, his friends would ask him, how is it that you're so successful, John? And he would, and he would show them this leather-bound journal he had, which he filled with beautiful pictures, quotes, and ideas on the kind of life he wanted to build. And he didn't just stop at business or health or relationship. He went deep. He went into 12 different areas. I want you to take out a pen or an iPhone if you don't have a pen and take these down. These are the 12 areas of balance. If you can think about your life in these 12 areas, this is when you truly start living beautiful lives like John Butcher. And you don't leave gaps. You don't end up the guy with the billion dollars but whose body is completely frail. So, the first area is health and fitness. If you're thinking about goals for health and fitness, what you want to think about is how many push-ups do you want to be able to do when you're 50? Do you want a six-pack? What, what type of waist size do you want? How far do you want to be able to run? Then there's your intellectual life. A lot of people forget this. How many books do you want to read every single month? What new languages do you want to pick up? What new skills do you want to have? How do you want to grow yourself and your skills professionally? Then there's your emotional life, another area that many people forget. How do you deal with stress, with anger? How do you maintain happiness in the now? What embodiment practices do you live with? Then there's your character. What are your values? What do you believe in? What type of person do you want to be? Do you want to be the kind of person that people know always stand by your word? There's your spiritual life. How often do you meditate? 
How often do you go to church or synagogue or temple or mosque? There's your love relationships. Who do you want to wake up with every morning? What does that relationship look like? What do you do together? How do you spend time together? There's your parenting vision. How many kids do you want to create? How would you be a parent? What values would you imbue your children with? How do you spend time with your kids? There's your social life. Who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? When do you hang out with them? How do you guys support each other? Your financial life. How much cash do you have in the bank? What can you afford? What are your financial goals for the next five years, 10 years? Saving, retirement plan, business, investments. Your career. What do you want to create, build, grow? What's the next promotion you're aiming for? Or the next company you want to build? Or the next blog or book you want to produce? Then there's your quality of life. It's amazing how many people forget this. What type of hotels do you want to stay with? How often can you travel business class? What would your house look like? What does your apartment and your office look like? How do you dress? How often can you take paradise beach vacations? How many times a year do you want to attend Awesomeness Fest? <laughs> then there's your life vision. On the day you die, what would people say about you? What mark do you want to leave on the world? So those are 12 areas. Now, if you can think of, of your goals in those 12 areas, you really start going deep. And this is when you truly become a well-balanced individual. The problem isn't just setting big goals. The problem is setting the right big goals in the right areas so that you don't leave anything out. I love this matrix of these 12 areas because of how, how holistic it is. But John goes a little bit deeper. So if you're doing life book, right, or if you're just writing this down, it's not just about the vision of what you want in these 12 areas. John also teaches certain things. Now, for each of these areas, we're going to pick financial just as an example, okay? Reformatting your money beliefs. The first thing is he has you write down your premise behind your financial life. What are your, your premise is your beliefs, or as we use the word here at Awesomeness Fest, your models of reality. What are your models of reality around money? Do you believe that money is the root of all evil or that money is an incredible force for good? Do you believe that you are entitled to all the money you want? Do you believe that money is even important or not? When you, after beliefs, you go on to your vision for money. And these were the things that we talked about earlier. How much money would you have in the bank? What would your investment plans look like? What would, what would your net worth be like? But you don't stop there. Then you go on to your action items. What are you going to do now to make that vision of money come true to you? How much are you going to start saving every single day? What new passive streams of income are you going to create? So your premise, your vision, your strategy, what you're going to do, and then finally, your purpose. Why is money important to you? What do you plan on doing with this money? So for each of these 12 areas, you go deep and you ask yourself, what are my beliefs on this? What do I want to create? What's my strategy to get there? And why do I want to get there in the first place? Now let's talk about one of the biggest goals that many of you may have written down, entrepreneurship. Here's something I want you to realize. Entrepreneurship is not a goal. It's too vague, it's too fluffy to be a goal. Entrepreneurship is the side effect of having the right goals. Nowhere on my list did I ever say I want to be an entrepreneur, because what exactly does that mean? What I want, though, is a gorgeous office, a beautiful business that's changing the world, employees I love coming to, 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 to work with every single day. I want a great body. I want to be amazingly fit. I want to be a good speaker. I want to write four books. The entrepreneurship is never a goal. It's the side effect of having the right goal. You'll learn more about this later on when we talk about the difference between means goals and end goals. It's one of the ultimate hacks in goal setting. But now, as we wrap up and you understand this, I want to put you in flow. But first, let's recap, okay? So, the secret, the grand secret of awesomeness, of existing, of being able to do massive things, the secret that I feel I accidentally stumbled upon when I went from um, accidental threat to the United States and broke and living on a couch in Berkeley to the kind of life I can build today is getting in that state of flow. And to get in that state of flow, what I shifted about myself was continuing to dream big, 
but not accepting stress as being part of that reality and disciplining myself through the art of discipline to have the right embodiment practices, the right systems of living to make sure my happiness was in check, to make sure I cont continuously visualize great futures for myself, to make sure I was motivated, excited, to practice intention setting, creative visualization, and all those other systems we talked about. When I could do that, massive shifts could happen. I could go from that miserable existence I had 10 years ago to the kind of life I, can, I have right now where I kind of have my own cool little awesome festival and I can come hang out with you guys, all expenses paid, in a paradise island and make new friends and do this twice a year and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and give it all away because I'm freaking rich anyway. <laughs> all because, all because of this process of being in flow. What's gonna happen in Awesomeness Fest, people, is that we are gonna try to put you in flow every hour of this entire event. But more than that, we're gonna teach you the formula for being in this flow. So as I said earlier, your ups stay and last longer and your downs are really, really, really narrow. And as you can see, a lot of this is scientifically proven. I don't like teaching the woo-woo. Almost all of this is scientifically proven. And once you accept this model, if you so choose, you start living life at a whole different level. My greatest wish for you is that you can continue doing epic shit while being happy right now. And knowing that, you know, even if you failed, it doesn't affect your happiness. But you will continue aiming big, even though you know you can't fail, because that's just how you roll. Thank you.